It's working! It's working! Yes! Woo! It's working! <laughs> and now, to give my creation life! <laughs> <laughs> that was easier than I thought. Building a compact gaming PC has never been simple, but thanks to the Fractal Design Terra, it's never been easier to put together the ITX system of your dreams. The vented top and side panels means every bit of your PC gets access to fresh air. Plus, the panels are toolless and removable, providing easy access to the internals from any angle. With room enough inside for even triple slot graphics cards, you'll be able to turn this 10.4 liter case into a frame ripping machine. Available in black, white, or my personal favorite, jade green. Stunningly good looks and build quality in the smallest size possible. Check out the Terra ITX from Fractal Design by following the links down in the video description. And thanks again to Fractal Design for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So the saga of my $500 dual node Epic server continues. In the last video, I got the server put together with an Epic 7601 CPU, eight sticks of DDR4 ECC memory, and slid it into the server rack, only for the system to never post. If you wanna see the full video, and it's definitely worth the watch, the link is down in the video description. While I fiddled a bit with the BMC via the onboard serial port, there were some pretty clear signs that the system wasn't booting properly. Namely, even if video had been disabled by the BIOS, the USB still likely would have recognized my keyboard. You can tell I'm a tech with decades of experience because I still use the NumLock light as a post test. That video ended with the server making a lot of noise and not much else. In the end, I asked for suggestions on what to try next. So let's cover a couple of those ideas now. Now, usually when I post videos like this, where I run into non-functional hardware and ask you the audience for some help, there's always a dozen or more people with the answers that I need. But this time around, you all sucked. Well, let me clarify. Quanta sucks for not keeping documentation on their website for a server that is only six years old. But of the 55,000 viewers on that video, only one person had any hands-on experience with the Quantaplex T22HF. And that was from the server store, who has a ton of these for sale. Now don't get me wrong, I do appreciate all of the suggestions and advice, and I'm frustrated with Quanta, not with you fine people. Quite a few of you did offer some great suggestions of things that I hadn't tried, like installing a video card to bypass the onboard video. Unfortunately, like I said, it turns out the server wasn't even posting, so that was a non-starter. There were quite a few suggestions around pulling the CMOS battery to force a BIOS reset, which I had actually already done off camera before the first video shot. A few people pointed out the console select switches on the motherboard, and I did try every possible configuration there, but no dice either, though one of those does disable the BMC controller altogether. One viewer, DevClouds, emailed me a qualified vendor list that he managed to find. To my surprise, all of the SKUs were actually Epic Rome CPUs, not first-generation Naples like I had thought. Even better, I happened to have an Epic 7282, which was on the QVL. I also had a full kit of 64GB DIMMs on the approved memory list. So I installed that CPU and a single DIMM into the server, and still nothing. But back to the comment from the server store. They only sell these servers with an Epic 7351P, a 16-core Epic Naples CPU. I figured it was worth at least one last hurrah, so I ordered a pair of them off eBay. Luckily, these are some of the most affordable Epic chips out there, costing only around $36 each. Well, those arrived yesterday, so I got one installed and... Hey! Yes! It's working! It's working! Yes! Woo! Finally! We got it to post, and we were into the BIOS. Next step, I figured I'd plug in a U.2 drive, get Windows installed, and see exactly what we were working with here. But of course, the server had some more surprises in store. In the last video, I mentioned that there were a total of three Oculink headers on the motherboard, all supporting NVMe U.2 drives, but only a single power plug was present. I figured at the very least I'd be able to plug in a single U.2 NVMe, 
but it turns out the data cable that they included was wired for SATA or SAS, not U.2 NVMe. Whatever. So I threw a one terabyte SATA SSD into it and went to install Windows. But again, ran into a bit of difficulty. In the BIOS, by default, boot settings were configured as legacy mode only. Being a modern platform, I wanted to boot with UEFI mode. So I switched modes, enabled network SAC support for the network card so I could install Windows from my WDS server. But then, more weirdness. Even with the boot mode locked to UEFI only, the server only seems to be able to use legacy boot mode. Network boot went straight to the legacy Pixie mode, which would have installed Windows with a legacy boot partition. So I grabbed my IODD ISO drive, selected it as the boot device, and again, the server tried to boot up the virtual CD drive in legacy mode as well. While not a huge deal, that might impact virtualization or device pass-through if that's something you were wanting to do with these servers. No matter though, let's go ahead and get Windows installed onto our SATA drive in legacy mode on an AMD Epic Blade running one of their weakest 16 cores ever. This deal is getting worse all the time. First off, let's see exactly how much performance we're actually working with. Cinebench R15 gives a multi-threaded score of 2063, which feels a bit low. First-gen Ryzen should at least be able to beat out Haswell and Broadwell CPUs from Intel. But I have the Xeon E5 2697A V4 showing a score of 2502 in my test library. That's 16 cores and 32 threads on both CPUs. So what gives? Well, it seems the Epic 7351P isn't getting out of its own way, as we're not seeing any boost clock speeds. The CPU instead stayed locked at its base clock speed of 2.4 GHz during my testing. In the BIOS, I also couldn't seem to find any switches to enable boost clocks, so this might be disabled by default by Quanta. And that might make sense if they were trying to stay within a power threshold in a server rack and it does seem that these are heavily limited. At full load, the 7351P only pulled 110 watts of package power, which is well below its rated 155 to 170 watt TDP. Overall, these blade servers actually sip on power, all things considered. With the blades powered off and only the fans inside the chassis running, we see around 40 watts of power draw from the wall. With a single blade on, idle power stays between 90 and 100 watts. With that single blade under full load, it stays right around 180 watts, again measured from the wall with a peak of 202. That's with a single one terabyte SATA SSD and eight DIMMs populated. Single threaded performance was also abysmal out of the box, scoring between 68 and 83 points. Those are some of the lowest scores I've ever recorded and well below the curve of 125 to 140 points from Sandy Bridge through Haswell Xeon CPUs. It seems that single-threaded load wasn't triggering the CPU to clock up from its 1.3 GHz idle state. And even then, we're only seeing around 50% utilization on a single thread. So what gives? Surely there must be some way to eke out a bit more performance out of this chip. We're obviously not power limited here, and thermals were barely hitting 30 degrees Celsius under sustained load thanks to the 12 degrees Celsius ambient temps in my garage. It is still winter time after all. Then I remembered back to some early first generation Ryzen performance testing inside Windows, where power plans would often limit CPU performance, sometimes pretty drastically. Here in Windows Server 2022, the default power plan is the balanced preset. Switching things over to high performance plan and woo! Oh yeah, now it's working. CPU package power jumps from 110 watts to 145 watts, and clock speeds are finally boosting all the way to the rated 2.9 GHz boost speeds, resulting in a top score of 2540 for multi-threaded testing and 119 in single-threaded performance. While I don't have any results from the very rare 22-core Xeon E5 2699v4, the Epic 7351P's score of 2540 means it beats out every single 16 and 18 core Xeon that I've ever tested. Single threaded though, 119 is a bit lackluster, as Broadwell chips can reach upwards of 150 points thanks to turbo clock speeds upward of 3.8 gigahertz. But those speeds are rarely seen, as power limits tend to kill clock speeds as soon as more than a couple processes are running on a chip. While these aren't results that will set the world on fire, the power draw is something that I'm mildly impressed with, at least in the realm of server gear. It's easy to see why first-gen Epic made such a splash when it launched back in 2017. 
Both performance and performance per watt were immediately competitive with Intel's best offerings, with 2019's Cascade Lake Xeons unable to make any substantial improvements while being stuck at 14 nanometer. So hey, this server isn't completely useless after all. Now, I'm still irritated about the complete lack of connectivity for drive trays up here in the front of the chassis. That means either one of the PCIe slots in the front of the blades needs to be used for NVMe storage, or potentially going full network storage with something like iSCSI. Also, being limited to only the Epic 7351P severely limits the power potential on display here, as I'd love to slap a couple 24-core Epic ROM CPUs in here and really let this thing go to work. But I need to dial things back a bit for today and judge the Quantaplex T22HF for what it is, not what it potentially could be. And right now, it's just not terrific. While the Epic 7351P is a 16-core chip, it's only a couple points faster than an Intel Broadwell Xeon at basically the same exact power draw. While the Epic chip made waves when it debuted, it mostly made waves because of its launch price of $750. Compare that to a Xeon E5 2697v4, which was available for the low, low price of just $2,700, and you see why AMD's Epic was such a big deal at launch. Today, though, comparing both of these chips, the Xeon 2697AV4 and the 7351P, both of them are available for under $40, and power draw is basically equal at around 145 watts. The decision of which to use is going to come down to platform cost. Hmm, let me put it this way. Do you buy an X99 compatible motherboard for well under $80 or spend $250 per blade on this proprietary nightmare that can only use a single CPU SKU? I'm still holding out some hope for what the system could potentially be. Like I mentioned, I'd love to throw a couple AMD Epic ROM CPUs into the system and see what the power potential is inside of the same envelope. But as it stands right now, $500 for the bare chassis with two motherboards and two power supplies, well over $1,000 once you configure it with CPUs and a decent amount of memory, and it's just not going to beat a Broadwell Xeon at substantially lower price points, drawing the same amount of power. And again, I'll put this out to the community at large. If you have any insight whatsoever into the Quanta T22HF or the underlying motherboard, which is the Quanta S5HF platform, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to be able to upgrade the system. And according to DevClouds, who sent me over a QVL, this should be capable of running Epic ROM CPUs. And one day, I really hope it will. But what do you guys think? Is $500 worth investing into the Epic 7351P, or is this a system that probably should have stayed in the e-waste pile? Let me know in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on the social medias at Craft Computing for daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider going over to craftcomputing.store, picking up one of our fantastic rocks glasses that is laser engraved out in my garage by me. That's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Mixology March continues here on the channel with the West Indian Cocktail. This is a super simple cocktail, but I actually wanted to use it to demonstrate a very contentious subject in the mixology community. Well, mixologists agree that this thing is stupid, but the rest of you need to get on board. And that is that sugar cubes have no place in 99% of modern cocktails. Now this cocktail starts off with a very familiar recipe if you follow the traditional old fashioned, which is a sugar cube and four dashes of Angostura bitters that you muddle into a paste. Now the problem with that is no matter how much you muddle that mixture, you're still going to wind up with a whole bunch of granulated sugar that's kind of wet with Angostura bitters. That will not dissolve into a solution of alcohol, especially one that's cold. And this drink does call for a single rock. So let's go ahead and add that now. There you go, got my beautiful ice cube. Now we're gonna add four dashes of Angostura bitters. And about a half an ounce of simple syrup. Now 
And hey, would you look at that? It's the mixture of bitters and sugar that the cocktail wants you to make through an hour of muddling and grinding granulated sugar into a solution. Or, you know, you could just dissolve the sugar into water before making the cocktail. Same thing. Next up, this calls for two to three tablespoons of freshly squeezed and strained lemon juice. And luckily I have some of the smallest lemons I've ever seen in my life. So we're just gonna squeeze one of those straight in. And because it'll look better on camera, we'll toss in a lemon wheel. Last but not least, we need two ounces of dry gin. And for that, I'm gonna use Bombay Sapphire. Give that a quick little spin cycle here. And there you have the West Indian cocktail. Now for future reference, if any cocktail ever starts out its instructions by telling you to muddle a sugar cube and bitters in the bottom of a glass into a slurry-like solution, just replace it with a half ounce of simple syrup. Job done.